they know their product, they know their business, but but trying to convey that in a way that is going to appeal to their clients is, you know, it's quite a skill to do that, actually. My name is Peter Sumpton, and this is the Marketing Study Lab podcast, a podcast for those that are thinking, have thought and are doing, or already have a marketing qualification. But there's a little bit of something for everyone as we cover a whole host of marketing topics. I chat to some amazing guests, each one a superstar in their own niche. And if you have a burning marketing question already or after this episode, get in touch. We'll chat it through. Peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn. The link is in the show notes. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, this will really help others find this podcast and spread the marketing word. Now let's get on with today's episode. The communications mix and the marketing mix are two very different things, but they are also intertwined, which we'll find out about a little bit later on. First, let's meet this week's guest. Victoria Doxat, a copywriter who specialises in copy, or should that be content, I'll let Victoria explain the difference in a little bit, for B2B clients ranging from entrepreneurs and SMEs to large corporations. It takes a special kind of person to be able to go deep into topics that others may find boring and turn them into readable and valuable content. But Victoria does this by producing articles, case studies, and even white papers that are anything but boring. Oh, Victoria is also a philosophy lecturer, as you do, with all that free time. Because copywriting's easy, right? Anyway, the burning question I needed to ask this week was, Victoria, can you say the alphabet backwards and no cheating? (laughs) No, I can't. And I've actually had a practice that no, I can't. Can you do it? (laughs) I, I knew you can ask. That. Yeah, moving on. No, no, no. I get to ask the questions. So let, let's have a look. Right, okay. So Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, S, R. No, I'm, I'm done. No. That, is, that was really good. I that... think I got as far as Y and then I gave up. <laughs> so you've got, yeah, you did better than me. Well, that's completely <laughs> Who needs to do then? that though, hey? When are you ever going to need to do that? Well, when, have you, when, it, when are you ever going to need algebra? But, you know, some people <laughs> it's do. True. <laughs> it's, it's true. Okay, let, let's get serious. What's the story okay. that's brought you to this stage of your career as um, a, a freelance copywriter? Okay, so um, it's a relatively recent thing for me. So I've only been uh, freelance copywriting for just over two years now. And um, prior to that, I was a teacher. In fact, I still am a teacher. I teach A-level philosophy um, and classics. And in the past, I've also taught A-level English. Um, And that's what I did straight out of university. So I did a degree in English. Then I went on to do a master's in philosophy. That got me into teaching philosophy. And then I I went full time at the college I was working in and picked up hours uh, teaching English and classics as well because they're kind of quite a good, quite a good mix. Really, they kind of support each other. The subjects do. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've always loved reading and writing. And um, the college where I work went recently a restructure, and there were lots of re- redundancies and a merger, and it was all. Um, it was basically due to the funding crisis, really in FE. Um, and as a result of these redundancies, um, I wasn't made redundant myself, but I saw a lot of people were, and I realised that perhaps it wasn't, you know, the job for life that I kind of always thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of started looking around for ways to future proof myself, really, and looked for what else I could do. Um, and a, a friend of mine works in communications, in internal communications. Um, and so she kind of asked me to help her out with a communications project. Um, and I, yeah, I just really liked it. I really liked working in uh, with on the project with her. That led to some work um, with a communications consultancy who I still work with um, on an ad hoc basis when they're busy. Um, and I just got really into, into writing for businesses, really. Um, and it's all the skills that I've got as a teacher. So it's like the soft skills, the communication skills. 
but also the written skills. So obviously teaching philosophy and classics, um, I can uh, express things clearly and I can um, write things in a way that's accessible to my students. Um, and I can pick out interesting things to feature in my materials and my learning materials that I produce for my students. So it's all the same, it's exactly the same skills in teaching. It's just now that I have transferred those into the world of business. Um, and yeah, it's been quite successful. So it's, yeah, it's been a, a bit of a sideways move really, I think, but it's, yeah, it's paying off. That, that, that's really cool that, that you utilizing other parts of different professions to bring it into copywriting and vice versa as well. That, that's really cool. Yeah, it's good. It's, it works out well, actually. And I think because um, like my, my background is in research, um, it helps me. Um, yeah, it kind of helps me understand, um, the, you know, what the client wants. And I know where to go to find the information to write the articles and the white papers and stuff. Brilliant. This brings us nicely on to the next question, which probably sounds like a bit of a simple, silly question to ask yourself. But can you explain what a copywriter actually does? Yeah, sure. I'll try anyway. Um, so there's some discussion about copywriting and content writing. So I think tradi the traditional view is that a copywriter is someone who writes for businesses with an aim to sell something, whereas a content writer is writing more to um, give information, I guess. From my experience, I don't think there's a massive difference between the two. So when I write for businesses, I'm writing uh, sales brochures or articles or write pa white papers. Uh, I write blog posts, um, kind of any kind of written resource really for businesses. And some of that is informative. Some of it is persuasive. Um, so I don't see that there's a huge divide between content writing and copywriting, but I'm sure that many people will disagree with me <laughs> on that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's basically writing for businesses, um, you know, writing information that businesses pass on to their clients or pass on to their customers or pass on to other businesses to explain their offers or their products or their services. That's, that's a really in interesting question to ask, you know, copy and content and, and, and the difference. I've never really thought of it like that. And when you when you put it in those simple terms, the potential differences, it's almost like for me personally, you can't really have one without the other today simply because people just want this open open and transparency. And if you're just writing copy with the aim to sell, it becomes massively difficult to become open and transparent. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, what's the difference between writing to persuade and writing to inform and writing to advise anyway? They're such small distinctions um, that I think if you're a good writer, you can have elements of all of that in the copy that you write anyway so yeah I call myself a copywriter um but yeah content writer I think would fit just as well do you have a favorite style of, of content or copy yeah I love writing articles and white papers I really like long form copy um I, I've got a research background so I've always enjoyed researching and writing um longer pieces um so yeah if I get a nice brief about writing an article then yeah that's my that's my hobby horse that's why I really enjoy writing right I, I think we're on very different planets with that one I, I'm, I'm just <laughs> I'm not a writer at all it, it, it really does amaze me when people write long form because uh, just it, it's just not my bag it's not my style it's not something that I, I, I take any pleasure in doing but sometimes you have to yeah, well, a lot of people don't, and that's where us copywriters come in, I guess. You you know, we, we enjoy doing it, and if it saves you time, um, you know, to do it, then obviously outsourcing it is, is a good good thing to do. It's without doubt one of those elements, along with uh, graphic design, web design, that fits into that marketing space that is very much a case of people that do not understand how important and how much it can influence people they're the ones that end up saying, well, can't such and such just write it? Can't you just write it? Yeah, and it's, that's the problem, isn't it? When yeah. businesses, especially small businesses, when they don't have a budget, or if they do have a budget, the last thing they want to spend money on is copywriting. They try to produce this content themselves. Um, and the people doing it are not necessarily excellent writers. Um, they know their product, they know their business, um, but, but trying to convey that in a way that is going to appeal to their clients is you know it's quite a skill to do that actually um which is why it's a good idea to outsource that if you can't you know hire someone in-house to do that for you yeah absolutely so I, I just want to turn this 
around and, and focus more on the students for, for, for a bit. Mm-hmm. And, and some students that are tackling marketing qualifications can struggle with doing the research and then almost implementing that with into an assignment. Yeah. What is your us- usual research and writing process? It's uh, a good question. So um, for me, I'm writing for a specific purpose. So I'm writing, so your students will be writing for an assignment. So the most important thing is to make sure that you've got the assignment brief in front of you because you don't want to be writing stuff that's not relevant, that's not going to get you those marks or that's yes. not going to meet the client requirements. So always have a copy of the brief in front of you. And then I I still write with pen and paper. I know that's a bit weird, but um, I so I tend to write headings first. So I think about the structure first and make sure that I tick all the points that the brief requires you to meet. Um, And then I start doing the research. So Google is obviously a good place to start. Or if you've got, um, you know, whatever you're writing about, you've got books to hand, but generally Google. Um, (laughs) And then you, you find the information that you need. You try and slot it within those headings. Um, And then at that point, once I've got kind of a couple of pages of text, I'll just leave it. I'll just go away and leave it for a bit. Um, and then I'll come back and start trying to structure it into um, a readable document at that point. So, yes, yeah, so I always start by looking at the brief and making sure that you're hitting the criteria in the brief. And then you go and do the research after that. I'm so Otherwise, you can go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you, you, you've said all that, simply because that's not as eloquently as that, but that's what I tell students to do. It's usually, if you're stuck, start with bullet points. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, four or five bullet points. You've pretty much got the structure then. Then you just go write an introduction and a conclusion and then you're pretty much done. Yeah. Okay, okay so you've got the bullet points, you've got the structure, you mm-hmm. get in there, but how do you know when you've when you've got it right? Are there any particular signs that you look for when you're actually writing these things? Um it's, it's I just get a feeling sometimes. So if you've spent a long time or something, so normally if you've spent kind of it normally takes about two days to write an article in total I don't always do it in two days but that's generally how long it takes me so um I I think the time you you don't want to spend too long on it so I think you once you look at it and you're looking at the brief you can tell whether you've hit the points that you need to if at that point it's fluently written it's about the right word count and it has the right feelings. So you've got the tone of voice right. You've got the um, the purpose right as well. Then that's generally when you can kind of draw a line under it. I usually leave it again for a while before I submit it to the client. So I'll have another read through. Again, just double check everything's okay. Check the references as well. Make sure they're right. Um, and if it reads well and it hits the points, then, yeah, you're, you're kind of done. I, I was just thinking then a great analogy there would almost be if you're actually a cook or you're, you're cooking something, best thing to do is probably walk away and get out of the house, then come back in and try it. Because if yeah. you're ingrained in that cooking process, you're going to have, have, have more, you're more involved in it. So you're going to want it to taste nice rather than leaving it and seeing it subjectively after. Absolutely. And you've got the danger then of putting more and more stuff in, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, and a bit more sugar. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think for me anyway, I definitely need to, to get some space away from that creative process because it is creative. It can be quite draining. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you write into a brief, but you're still putting a lot of yourself into that. So you do need some time away from that and then to come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes. And normally it's then that you can uh, see if there's anything else that needs doing or whether you can kind of sign it off. So you said there, writing's almost a creative process. Mm-hmm. Is it difficult to write about something you have no interest in? Or, or do you just gradually grow that interest as you're researching and writing? Yes, I am I mean, I'm quite interested in a lot of things anyway. I don't think there's anything that I'm definitely not interested in. I've written for, um, I've written for some agencies on um, employee benefits and pensions, which, you know, pensions are not the most interesting things <laughs> to read about really or to write about um but for me the the interest comes from trying to get that information and relay it in a way that helps someone to understand their pension because it's really important that you understand your pension Mm -hmm. so my job really is to take that kind of quite dry quite dull information and try to make it more accessible so although the the content itself that i'm writing about might not be the most interesting the process of 
making that content engaging and accessible is where the interest comes in for me and that's the creative bit and that's the bit that i really love uh, I, I think that i think that's great the the fact that you, you're taking just a, a dull bland or, or potentially do some people love pensions and reading about it but taking it <laughs> apparently and, and, some people do <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 what the, the way you're viewing it is how can i get these key points across because it's massively important but i need if i'm not interested in it then no one else will be and that, yeah i really love that approach it's fantastic thanks so in terms of style, oh, by the way, uh, that pensions document, if you can send me that, because I literally have no interest in it. And if <laughs> <laughs> that'd be really good yeah. if you can explain t- it to me. <laughs> yeah, t- okay. Oh, it's, it's in the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, how important is it in terms of style of writing and, and to change it up depending on the project you're working on? Oh, it's really important. It's everything really to get the tone of voice right. Um, each brand, yeah. It, each brand is a person looking really so when you you deal with other big brands or small brands they've got their own unique um way of speaking in the same way that you've got your own unique way of speaking and i've got my own unique way Mm -hmm. of speaking and you have to match that very carefully to the brand so um for example if you were writing for a uh uh, a builder's yard for example you would want to use words and a tone that um you know was going to be relevant to people who are going to be wanting building work done if you are writing for a um a high quality Savile Row tailors for example you're not going to use the same sort of language you're not going to use the same sort of tone because it's a completely different um type of audience that you're going to be appealing to or maybe not but it's certainly a different product and a different uh brand Mm -hmm. so yeah so getting the tone of voice right is really important and, and that is something that you need to be hyper aware of when you're writing that's where the brief is so important because the brief will tell you um, exactly the sort of tone of voice that you, you're aiming for. Okay, so what do people get wrong when they try to write content? Um, so the, I think the major thing is not sticking to the brief. So if you go outside of the brief, if you start writing things that you think the client wants or even worse, start writing things that you want to write, um, you are not going to do very well mm-hmm. because you're right. You're not writing for yourself. You know, when you're a copywriter, you leave your ego behind. No one knows my name. <laughs> so yeah. my name's not on anything that I've written. I get, I've written a few, a uh, few articles in magazines where I've got a byline, which is lovely, but that's not my client work. Um, client work is always anonymous. So you are writing as if you are your client basically. So you've got to leave yourself at the door and just write what they want you to. Um, you can have a healthy conversation and you can say, actually, I think it might be better this way for these reasons. And that's great to have that conversation. Um, but ultimately, you know, they're the client. They're, they're paying you to provide a service and you need to um, make sure that what you're writing is what they want, really. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, pure, pure and simple. Stick to the brief first and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so are you ready for some quick fire questions? I am. Excellent. Let's do this. Name one must-read business book. Okay, it's probably the only business book I've read, to be honest, but it's um, Influenced by Robert Caldini. Oh, I love and it's it. brilliant. Oh, it's such a good book. It's, yeah, it's a psycho- psychological book, really, isn't it, about it, but, you know, it applies to marketing. But, yeah, it's so well written. I really like him. Um, have, you, have you read his other book, A Persuasion? No, I haven't, it's but much... that's been recommended to me by a few people. It's a much shorter book. In fact, I think the references he uses are longer than the actual book. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> but it's it's along the same lines as Influence. It okay. Just takes it it, it, it's more, I'd say it's more up-to-date because Influence is, is, is quite dated now. But yeah, it's, it's really still old, brilliant. Yeah. But Persuasion's just as good. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I think you must be the third person to recommend that to me, so I'll put it on my summer reading list. Excellent. Thank cool. you. <laughs> uh, what was the last thing you Googled? Got a, so I, I actually checked this. This is really random. I actually bu- um, Googled a Buddhist monastery <laughs> because my son's a beaver and they do all these amazing things and they go and visit these cool places. And um, they went to a Buddhist monastery yesterday. So I had to Google the directions so that I could take him there. And it okay. was really cool. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it was that- great. All the beavers were asking them if they had any chipmunks. <laughs> <laughs> and the monk was there. No, we don't have chipmunks here. <laughs> I, I like the thought process, though. I know he's a six-year-old kid, so it's yeah. You um, 
yeah, you get a lovely insight into <laughs> their, how their minds work. <laughs> okay. What is your most used app at the moment? Oh, LinkedIn. Definitely. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. That's where most of my business comes from. Um, my, my, my networking is on LinkedIn. Um, and I publish quite a lot on LinkedIn as well. So, Excellent. yeah, that's my most used app. What would be a one tip for people who are studying at the moment? Oh, God, pace yourself. Don't get stressed. Um, don't leave it to the last minute. Um, yeah, don't don't compare yourself to other people. And, you know, you know what you've got to do. Chunk, try and chunk it down. So it's better to do an hour a day over three months than it is to do an all nighter mm-hmm. the day before the assignment. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, like, honestly, it is. It sounds, um, it, yeah, you, you put it off and put it off, but ultimately you, you're harming um, your your future potential by doing that, really, I think. So, yeah, try and, you know, pace yourself and, and get started as soon as possible on those assignments. Final question. Mm-hmm. What is your favourite letter of the alphabet? A. A for awesome. <laughs> I quite like that. I like the way you rationale it as well. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> uh, that wasn't actually the final question, Victoria. If people want to know more about you, where can they find you? Uh, okay, so I've mentioned LinkedIn. You can find me on there. And my name is Victoria Doxat. Um, or in my website is Um So, yeah, you should be able to find me in those places and um yeah happy to answer any questions or if anyone wants to reach out to me that's cool victoria it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today oh it's been lovely to talk to you too thanks once again victoria for joining us absolute pleasure here are my takeaways from that really riveting conversation with victoria about all things copywriting and content which is there a difference I can't remember. Anyway, that's what our first takeaway is about. It seems there is a bit of a difference between content and copy. Victoria explained that copy aims to sell something, whereas content provides the audience with the information they need to make a valid decision. But is there a real difference? I'll let you decide. As long as it has good intentions, it's all good for me. There are some tips that Victoria kindly shared with us that can be used in most writing situations, including marketing assignments. First off, remember you're writing for a specific purpose. Remember this. Always have the brief, task or question in front of you. Secondly, use headings and structure to make your writing easy to follow and a basis for the main topics you want to cover. Then do your research. Research the simple things first. Remember, Google is your friend in most instances, but also use books, podcasts, audio, video, anything that provides you with content, valid information. The third tip is to start to slot your findings under each appropriate heading. And finally, once you've done this, you can start to structure your assignment or content and make it readable. This doesn't have to be done until the other steps are complete. So you don't have to think about getting it right first time or that you can't change it later. It's a process, not carved in stone. And the final tip is when writing assignments or in an exam situation, make sure you are making it interesting. Don't be afraid to get creative. We've heard this before, but it's worth reiterating. Remember who is reading your content and make sure it resonates with them, but in your own language own tone so it's undeniably yours okay and finally this week our top tip this is very brief but massively important and it's about what so many do without noticing it and this is confusing the extended marketing mix the seven p's with a marketing communications mix now they are intrinsically linked and you can't have one without the other but in short The extended or digital marketing mix is the seven P's, covering all elements such as price and people, which we have been discussing on the previous eight episodes of Marketing Study Lab. Now, I haven't gone mad because we covered the seven P's, one in each episode, and then we had a roundup episode. That's why there was eight episodes on it. The marketing communications mix is part of the promotional element of the seven P's. Think of this as the elements that your consumers actually see and are engaged by 
the tip of the marketing mix iceberg, if you like, your content, communication channels, and calls to action. Don't get the two mixed up or confused. The world won't end, but to be honest, I'm not prepared to see if it would. Thank you so much for joining us today on Marketing Study Lab. It really means the world that you're listening to this out there. And hopefully I've provided you some value. If you're looking to know more about what Marketing Study Lab does and is about, go to marketingstudylab.co.uk or get in touch with me personally, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or feel free to email me at peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Happy marketing. Oh.